so uh, yeah so neil is um his is we, we could if if he was um born in sweden he, he would probably be neil's son to barry but he's uh but he's the nth generation descendant of um, some illustrious um swedish engineers being a a um a, 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 an engineer himself and in fact heading up the, um, the the family firm that we'll be hearing about this evening and uh, that we can see in the background um, so um please um over to you neil and we're very grateful and excited <laughs> you're you're overselling me already alex it's best if i start mm. low so good evening everyone um, first of all, I, I'm humbled because you're all way more Swedish than me, although my name's pretty good. Um, I gave this lecture last year to a livery company that Alex and I are in as one of our ways of trying to continue the camaraderie that livery companies are so well known for in an online way. And we had a, we had a good evening. It was intended to be a relaxed conversation almost. And that's my plan here. Alex. Um, having listened to it very nicely said, would I be willing to do the same again to you? So what an honor, thank you. The story starts with my great grandfather, Christa Peter Sandberg. I'm starting with Christa Peter Sandberg, who came from Sweden to London in 1860 and set up the business that I now run. He was an engineer, his skill was to do with mainly railways, and in the late 1800s, that was an extraordinarily busy time for railway consulting engineers. And we were designing railways all over the world. So railways in China, in, in what was in a rather British Empire way, Siam, um, extraordinary things they were achieving over 150 years ago. He had three children. Christa Peter Sandberg, which is always a bit confusing if you're trying to go through the history and you've got two with the same name. Niels Percy Patrick and Oscar Friedolf. Oscar Friedolf, the man on the left of this picture, was my uh, grandfather. These three men are really the reason for this story about the Egypt, which I will now move to. So the Egypt was a liner that was commissioned on the Clyde at Greenock, launched in 1897. Um, passenger ship, generally running between London and India, um, had an extraordinary history. Um, during World War I, for example, she was a hospital ship. Um, our story starts on the 19th of May, 1922, when the Egypt left Tilbury, carrying the crew and 44 passengers, and a cargo that included gold and silver bullion and gold sovereigns worth over a million pounds in those days, around 200 million at today's gold price. The voyage proceeded normally, until the early morning of the 20th of May, when they encountered fog. As a safety measure, Captain Collier reduced speed. The Egypt remained in fog until the afternoon, when the navigator was able to sight landmarks on the French coast. He was just off Brest. So they had a good fix of the ship's position. After continuing the voyage for several hours, they went into a dense fog bank and around 7 p.m. they stopped engines but almost immediately heard another ship's whistle. The steamship the Seine emerged through the fog and within seconds struck Egypt's port side 28 miles off the Armen lighthouse at Finisterre. The Seine had a strengthened bow for ice breaking, and she penetrated deeply into the Egypt's hull before the dri ships drifted apart. The severe list hindered the launching of lifeboats, so rafts and deck fittings were all cut loose so that they might float when the ship sunk. 
that action save the lives of many. There were several instances of heroism. One case was that an army officer who jumped into a boat and forced its occupants to return to the side of the sinking ship, eventually getting another 70 people away. Meanwhile, the vessel, which had done the damage, took all the survivors on board and conveyed them to Brest. So we're 20 miles off the Arnhem Lighthouse. A distress signal has been transmitted and replies were received, but the Egypt sank within 20 minutes before the ships arrived. Most of the passengers and crew were able to abandon ship and the lifeboats, but 96 people on board lost their lives. So this was a, a tragedy of its time. Now, um, you may think, why on earth am I showing you a picture of a satellite? This, um, this picture was taken from the space shuttle when it was employed by Lloyds in a salvage operation. It was, at the time, the highest ever salvage operation, of course and Lloyd's had paid out. The link to our story was Christa Peter Sandberg, who you saw in the second slide, having heard about the, the loss of the Egypt, it was insured by Lloyd's. Lloyd's lived next door to Christa Peter and probably over a rather enjoyable boozy dinner they discussed what they could do about it. And in a entrepreneurial, um, slightly uh, brave way, um, Christa Peter suggested that they would salvage the ship. No one had ever salvaged a ship from that depth, it was 400 foot, but he said, we'll give it a go, but how are we gonna pay for it? And it was agreed that if they salvaged the ship, they could keep half the gold. Lloyd's had paid out on the loss within two weeks. Extraordinary. So here we have a picture of the highest ever salvage. My next slide is Ronald Reagan and George Bush Sr. visiting Lloyd's when he was still president. And this was just after the satellite salvage. He is being presented by the chairman of Lloyd's with a gold coin from the Egypt, symbolizing the deepest ever salvage of its time. This story goes on and on. Back to the ship. There you see her as a hospital ship, Red Crosses. Um, I said that um, she sank um, just uh, off breast. Um, the Bay of Biscay can be a pretty scary place if you are um, nautical. And um, if I go to this slide, this is this is a photograph of the. It's a very famous photograph of the Arnhem, Arnhem Lighthouse. They were twenty miles off this in um, an area that was extremely rough, extremely challenging, and they were now trying to do a salvage on the deepest ever. I'm just going to go back one slide. When she, when she sank, this was the headline from, the, from the, the Times, Monday, May 22, P&O liner sunk, Egypt lost off Oshant. We'll come back to that. Christa Peter, having, been, having, having set off on this task to, to, to salve the gold from this ship, um, well, what would he do? Of course, he would go to the Gothenburg Salvage Company. And um, the, first, the first task was to find the ship, which was incredibly difficult. Um, the technique they used was to tow an anchor behind the salvage ship. And whenever it hit something, they would send a diver down to have a look and see what they'd found. Two years later, they still hadn't found the ship. And very sadly, at that point, the Gothenburg company had decided that this was not something they could carry on 
and you can imagine the despondence all around. Um, Christopher Peter then had to find another salvage company and he employed an Italian organization called Serema, who um, provided this boat, which is the Artiglio. Um, the Artiglio carried on doing the same. Uh, each, each season would be steaming up and down between marks, desperately hoping to find its anchor caught on something. At the end of the season, the marks that they used for their course, one of them had drifted. And once again, they hadn't found the ship. Um, eventually, a lookout found the, the corner buoy of the um, search area. And they went to pull it up. They pulled and pulled and pulled. And eventually, it came up with a bang. And on the end of it, there was a derrick, as in a small ship's crane. They went down to look at the drawings of the Egypt, and irritatingly, the crane was a different size to those on the drawings. Except there was one crane for the captain's launch, and that was a smaller crane. They compared it, and at last they had found the Egypt. A very exciting moment, and yet they hadn't even started to um, begin the salvage process. Christopher Peter Sandberg, he, he wasn't a salvage man, he was an engineer, but he was an entrepreneur and he was a, an extraordinary enthusiast and inventor. So part of his involvement, other than funding this, was to make gadgets, diving equipment um, that could possibly work as they tried something of a depth that hadn't been achieved before. Um, Many of Peter's ideas were um, successful, but in the way of many entrepreneurs, many weren't. Um, and I'll come back to some of his diving kit. This slide is um, taken by uh, Kevin Pickering in 2006. The Egypt is now a, a, quite a famous wreck to dive on. Um, here they are. No, even though it's even though it's day daylight up up top, pitch black um, at that depth. Um, these guys are using diving bells. The uh, Sarima team had nothing of that. They had no lights. Uh, it, it, incredibly difficult challenge for them. Um, moving uh, on to. Um, so to, so to do the salvage, they had to position the artiglio over the wreck very precisely, and they would then dangle um, a man in a cage, and I'll show you the cage in a second. Um, and he, uh, he would have radio contact to the surface, and he would literally be saying left a bit, right a bit, whilst on another crane from the ship, they had a grab that would be either placing explosives or um, tearing away wreckage to get down the ship. Um, if I jump forward, um, let me see where. Here we go. That's an artist's impression of the Egypt lying on the uh, seabed. Um, many of these pictures and stories were um, courtesy of a Times correspondent who, the Times decided this was such an interesting story, they had someone on the salvage ship throughout the operation, a man called David Scott, and this is one of the sketches that he made. The bullion room was at the bottom of the ship, and it was, it was running uh, across the ship um, its entire width. So to get to the bullion room, they had to blast through the decks, uh, and this is this is a picture showing that. Blast through the decks. Um, after they blasted, the grab, which you can see in the picture, would clear away the debris. The diving bell is also in the picture there, which was nicknamed the ship's eye. For that diving bell, which um, I'll jump back to. Uh, 
Uh, there's, there's the top of the diving bell. Um, this, they tried to have um, an air pipe to the surface, but that caused more trouble because it was yet another thing to get snagged. So the favorite result was instead of an air pipe, they used chemicals to clean the oxygen in the cylinder. Mainly, uh, mainly it was removing the carbon dioxide. And they'd worked out that they had about an hour of oxygen with their chemicals for the diver. If anything went wrong, they had a very small window to recover. And there was only one cable holding the diving bell. Uh, one more cutting from the Times, which was um, September 1930. Um, so we're now eight years after the sinking, which was uh, an article about the Italian salvage crew had at last found the Egypt. Got a close up of um, how they were recovering the gold. You can see on the left, you have the diving bell or the ship's eye. By now, they, they'd found another way of stabilizing the diving bell, which was attaching it to a heavy weight on the left, which they called the pair. Um, and in the middle of the picture towards the bottom, you can see the grab. So this grab is trying to collect gold bullion. It's trying to collect um, banknotes, which I'll come to. It's trying to connect silver, and it's trying to collect sovereigns. You don't want them to fall out of the grab on the way up because there's no chance of recovering them. So Christopher Pisa designed a double grab. And at the top of the picture, you can see the second grab that sort of envelops the lower grab on its way up, uh, hoping to catch as much as possible as they go. Here's another picture of um, the divers. A lot of the, 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 um, the book that David Scott wrote, so much of it was about the bravery of the people involved and the camaraderie of the Italian team. Here you've got a close up of the double grab I'm talking about. Um, on the deck of the ship, you can see the main grab with the one um, enveloping it above. Here's a bulkhead that they have uh, removed. Um, I'm told if you're trying to salvage a ship, it's better if it's not a passenger ship because passenger ships have more bulkheads even separating cabins, for example. You can see from the picture it's riveted. They were placing explosives in eight foot long pipes along the lines of the rivets. Then diver would come up to the surface. They would um, plug in the detonator and hope that they'd had a successful explosion. Then down they go with a grab and they pull up that wreckage. This picture shows an extraordinary recovery of the captain's safe. Um, you can imagine the excitement when they get something like that and extraordinary with that grab that it actually makes it to the surface. Uh, here, here you have a picture that if you look carefully in the center grab, you can see there's uh, a gold bar resting in its jaws. And here's a very happy Italian crew with gold and silver um, on show and probably lots under their hats. The man back right on this is, um, his name was Quaglio. He was in charge of the salvage company. And um, this was not a big company. He had invested all his money in this. And until they'd found the gold, it was looking pretty desperate occasion. In the foreground, you've got gold bars. Behind them, on the left, you can see there's some paper. These are banknotes that are left out there to dry. Lloyd's, um, in an understandable way, were concerned about the value of all this. So they had someone on the ship that was there purely to audit what was coming up and what was released. Uh, David Scott's comment on this was, 
it was an extraordinary thing to do because these crew were so honest and so special, you could have left everything out all night and nothing would have been touched. That's a lovely picture of Quaglio with two gold bars. Now, the story doesn't end there. So by now they've recovered um, most of the most of the gold um, and um, are planning on heading off to uh, to Plymouth. And I have a film about this in a second. However, the French decided that this should be their goal because it was in waters just off Brest. So as the time says, cargo put under arrest. Luckily enough, that didn't last long. Uh, it was released. Um, it was released the following day. But when I was doing some reading, background reading on this, I, I found this extraordinary film. It was Ovi Artiglio returning to Plymouth. There's, there's no sound, and it's from the 1930s, so bear with me. It should say a Swedishman's invention, not an Englishman's invention. So there's our diving bell. This is crating up the gold and silver bars. So here's our diver with his breathing kit. Uh, this last photo I've got of the Artiglio. So here we are in Plymouth. Um, in the crane, you can see there are eight, this time, silver ingots. Um, but rather nicely, when I found this picture, um, the two men in Trilby's are my grandfather and great-grandfather. So Christopher Peter Sandberg, who was the idea behind the whole thing, with his brother. Um, just want to come up with a couple of um, uh, a couple of stories that related to this. Um, this was a th this became a national story. Um, the country was behind this um, huge excitement of, of um, recovering the gold. So um, when it was when it was found, it was brought back. Um, Sir Percy McKinnon, who was chairman of Lloyd's, wrote to Mussolini in 1932. And the letter goes, the chairman of Lloyd's sends congratulations to all Italians upon the magnificent success which has been achieved by their fellow countrymen in solving the gold in the Egypt. Their success is a practical illustration of the advantage of international cooperation and if all nations would join together in the same spirit to solve the world from the deep waters in which it is now submerged, success would be speedily attained. He was, of course, referring to Europe. Um, that, that letter caught quite a few people's attention. And um, uh, for those of you who know the magazine, the satirical magazine Punch, um, 
Punch decided this was a good enough subject to um, write an article about it themselves. And they gave Quaglia, the salvage company boss, the honor of appearing in its pages in a cartoon, which Ramsay MacDonald, the prime minister at the time, is seen to be appealing to a diver in full equipment with the word Artiglio on his chest to come and make another great recovery. The Lausanne conference was then sitting. The British Prime Minister is seen in the cartoon pointing uh, down the road to Lausanne saying, you have done wonders with the Egypt. Now see if you can get something up from the wreckage of the Europa. This was 1932. And as we all know, seven years later, the tragedy of the Second World War. I mentioned sovereigns. Here's one of the sovereigns that um, was recovered. So that had been underwater for um, 10 years. Uh, and it, it was uh, one of those was one that was presented to um, Ronald Reagan. And there's a final picture of the Artiglio in the harbor. That's the story of the Egypt. It was, it was a wonderful story of inventiveness, of bravery, of courage, sometimes perhaps a bit foolhardy thinking they could do it, but they did. And it cost about as much as they recovered in the gold. So it wasn't a great financial success, but it was a wonderful success that here I am um, 90 years later talking about it. Very happy to answer any questions. In English, not Swedish, please. Um, and we'll see, see how we get on. Thank I have a you. question, Sharon. Did the Hello. Swedish company who worked for two years without success, did they get any compensation for all their work? No, um, very, very frustrating in, indeed for Gothenburg Salvage Company. Um, I, I, I actually had the contract uh, that they signed in mid 1920s and um, I, actually that's not quite true both these both these salvage contracts there was there was a fixed fee and a success fee so they each got a little but frankly the fixed fee wouldn't have paid their costs I was going to, Neil, um, what happened to those plucky Italians who did so well? Did they, were they spurred on to try more things of that sort or has history lost them? No, no it, it, it's, it's a good question. And in, in, in my background reading on this, so the, um, the Italians on the salvage ship were paid 65 pounds a year without success fees. So they're, they're not in a very happy place. Um, but they also would have a share agreement with um, the salvage company. So once they'd got some gold, then um, very exciting. Um, in terms of what they went on to do, uh, I have no idea, but there's, a, there's a, another side story to this. Um, the Artiglio wasn't the first Artiglio. There was a previous one owned by the same salvage company, which um, had a catastrophe in that um, when they were um, salvaging another ship in the Mediterranean three years before, um, they'd made a mistake with the explosives cargo and that ship blew up. So there was a horrible sense of um, sadness with those who were lost when the ship blew up. Um, and I suppose in a way this was um, perhaps closure for them on, on their, their mates um, who tragically died when that one failed. So there's, there's one other um, thing which I, I tried to bring from the office today, but I couldn't find it in time. We have um, hundreds of banknotes uh, that were salvaged, um, uh, uh, a thousand kronen from the Austro-Hungarian bank. Um, and they're in remarkably good condition. Um, 
in our modern world now, if you go onto eBay, you'll find them for sale for very little. Um, they, my father investigated whether they were valuable or not, and he was told, yes, you're very lucky, unless they have a red stamp on the back. And sadly, all ours have red stamps on the back. And my business has a chemistry lab, and you would think with a good chemistry lab, we could take the red off, but no, it hasn't worked. What is the red stamp? I think it, 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 I think it was being returned to Germany. Um, I can't remember the exact word, but it was, it was, um, it was a stamp that include, uh, included the word Deutschmark. Deutsch. Uh, so I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure, Alex. Um, was this a sort of a one-off? It is, in, in, as you pointed out, a, a very um, adventurous thing for an, for an engineering firm to suddenly have a, an I know moment. Uh, <laughs> very atypical for, for what you yeah. got up to in the last century and a half, I suspect. No, I think it makes, my, it makes us look much less interesting and more dull now. Um, I think I... I this was, the, the, these were intrepid times. Um, I wonder if our world is, or, or it's a different level of intrepid perhaps, but um, no, I, 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 I certainly I haven't, I, we aren't, we aren't on, any, on any ventures quite like that at the moment. Um, although wouldn't it be exciting? You, you spoke about the, um, uh, your grandfather's inventions and said that some of them were less successful than others. Can you mention any of his less successful inventions and works? Uh, yes. So, so one of his less successful inventions, which looks wonderful, um, and I wonder if I even have a picture. I don't think I have a picture of it. Um, let's have a quick look. Um, so one of the problems was, how on earth would we um, manage to cut our way through the ship um, when really you couldn't? You couldn't move. So he designed an articulated suit, um, which seems very clever as a thought. Um, trouble was, it leaked. And you can imagine that's not really very popular for the poor divers. So we tried the articula articula articulated suit um, with articulated arms and legs and with pincers for hands. And so that was that was one of the failures. Um, and uh, another, another, another thing that didn't work. I mentioned um, you've got to be careful how you keep fresh air in the diving bell. And we had tried airlines. Um, the trouble with airlines is they also add a point of weakness. So that was another area that, um, whilst it looked clever at the time, uh, didn't work. I'm sure there are many more that he kept quiet about. Um, Gunilla wants to know what happened to all the gold bars. <laughs> um, that's a that's a, a, oh, are you, a good are, question. Are you reaching under your desk? As, uh, uh, uh -huh. yes. See what I found earlier. So, um, the last of the recovered tre treasure that we did was 1935, but still unaccounted are. 14,929 sovereigns, 17 gold bars, and 30 ingots. So whether those are down the trousers of the Italians, or they just never found them, who knows? Um, there was a, an article in the, in the paper about eight years ago about um, some other wreck divers on the Egypt who did recover some more treasure, which the French then impounded again. Uh, so. Um, I doubt there's much less left, but one of my thoughts was if you're having to blast your way through the ship, how on earth are you not going to spread your, your treasure all over the seabed? But they were clever at it and they um, managed to do that very well. I think, I think to have recovered um, all but 17 gold bars is quite something. The charges, uh, they found that in a way, Putting a charge underwater helps a bit because the water helps you direct the explosion towards the bit you're trying to. Um. 
And we have a question from uh, Peter Arnos. Uh, thank you, Alexander. Uh, thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, just a bit of a techie question on. So the bell was a one was a one man bell. So you yes. had a single diver in the bell, and was he under pressure, or was it was it a dry bell or a or under pressure? And did he exit the bell? Uh, on the seabed or got down by the wreck. No, so so the, the idea of the bell was everything stayed at atmospheric pressure, so um, surface level. Yeah. Um, you wanted it to stay dry. It did leak a bit. It had windows and the, the windows leaked. Um, it was balanced depending on which diver, so they would put um, uh, weights on it depending on which diver was in. Um, they did have one occasion where they were trying to pull the bell up and the boom snapped. Now at that stage, the poor diver, um, so the boom snapped and the um, telephone cable failed. So you've got the poor diver who's now um, still connected by the lifting cable, but the lifting gear on the on the ship has failed, so they've got to replace that very quickly. He has no idea if that's curtains or not. And luckily enough, they um, rigged another crane quickly, pulled him up, and that must have been quite a special moment when he popped his head up. Um, so, so the en endurance was limited by the air supply rather than the pressure. There was no under there was no pressure difference because he was he was under. No, uh, and and so the, the, the bell was designed to be structurally strong, strong enough to cope with the pressure at 400 foot. Um, and from, from the reading I've done, it, it seemed like after an hour, they were running out of air. Okay. Uh, where is the bell now, do we know? There is one in, uh, in, a, um, in a museum uh, salvage. Well, actually, there, there are a few of them, including the articulated one um, in a museum in the States. I think it's in Florida. I can't remember where. Um, so both both the the type that they used on the Egypt and more interestingly the articulated ones, which actually later were used for other salvages once they managed to sort out better seals. Interesting. Thank you. Um, I think maybe Barbara had her hand up, but you need to unmute. Sorry, Barbara. Yeah. Here we go. Hello, Neil. I would like to ask you why and how come that your great grandparents went over to Britain? Why? Was it because of commercial interests or were they just immigrants? Well, I, 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 I suppose I always, I always laugh that um, Nigel Farage wouldn't want me because I'd be an immigrant. <laughs> um, so, uh, Christa Peter Sandberg, 1860, um, he was sent from Sweden to London, where um, the rails were being manufactured for the Swedish state railways. Um, so his job was to audit the factories, to check that they were doing sensible things, that the designs were sensible. And he enjoyed it so much, maybe because it, he met my great grandmother, that he decided to stay and set up our business, um, business then. Um, okay. I understand. Yes, thank you. Where, where in where in Sweden did he come from? Um, he was from Gothenburg, uh, and I, I rather sadly, the um, the the history uh, is not as is not as strong as I'd like it to be. Uh, we have a lovely painting of a house they had um, in the countryside. Uh, called, it was called Björka. Um, I don't know. Does Bjorka mean anything? Yep. Um, I know. Uh, well, well, is that is that a? I think that was the name of the house. Okay. Well, um, there is um, an island in the Gothenburg archipelago called Bjorka. Okay. okay. I think that's. So I think they had a house there, which we have a lovely painting of. But um, that's sadly a lot of the history is gone. Mm. Um, I must say there's quite a lot of Gothenburg here in um, uh, on my screen this evening. Yes, yes, the, 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 
the, the, the third um, the third sister society that was founded at more or less the same society at that time as, as us, of course, is the Anglo-Swedish Society in Gothenburg. And um, we have, they are well represented here this evening. And apart from Barbara, Barbara's heart is, is partly in, in, in Gothenburg, I think. So, in, um, Alex, do you think we should have a livery trip to Gothenburg? Gothenburg <laughs> would be the thing, yes. <laughs> yes. There's, there's one other uh, story towards the end of this that um, when my um, grandfather uh, was was on this mission to, to find find the gold he did rather brazenly say to my father and my aunt who were children um, that if ever they found the gold the children could have whatever they liked so there was a very embarrassing phase where after they'd found the gold um, he came up to my father and uh, my father's sister and said, well, you know, I'm a man of my word. I did promise that if we found the gold, you could have anything you wanted. So my father and sister got into a huddle and came rushing back saying what they'd really, really like would be taken to, would be taken to Gilbert and Sullivan at the Savoy Theatre. How sad they could have had. <laughs> so that's so that's what the family did. Um, hmm. How are we doing? So, do we have any other hands up? No. What's well, the what's the second most exciting thing that that your firm has done? I think working in China from the 1880s to the 1900s is an extraordinary thing to have been doing. And we were designing railways. So within our archives, we have pictures of the Sandberg Rail at the gate of Peking, as we called it in a very British way. Um, and how these guys were managing to do this, how they were surviving, how they were getting paid when you know, it took six months to get home. Uh, extraordinary things. Very brave um, and fun. Well, I, I must say that was um, that was um, even better the second time round because I've had a, a, a dress rehearsal with with Neil uh, once before, which which led me to say, please, please come and and and, uh, and tell us about it. Um, really, just a huge thanks. And if I was to um, uh, say, if, if, if we were meeting in person, I would, I would thrust um, a, 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 a redundant uh, tie in, in, in your general <laughs> well, What's a tie? Well, this has uh, so the, the Anglo bits and the <laughs> bits, you know. How, the, what, a, what a very nice thought, Alex. But, uh, <laughs> it, it, but, 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 um, but, but, but you're spared, but, but if you would um, accept um, a year's complimentary membership of the Anglo-Swedish Society, then we can keep you in the loop. <laughs> Alex, that's, that's very, very kind. How nice. Oh, good. Yes, thank you. Uh, that, I'll, I'll take that as a, as a yes, and, and, and Lucy will um, uh, note duly. And that's Lucy Sanderberg. Yes, Lucy, Lucy of Sanderbay, who's um, English, but whose husband is, is like you, a, a, a Swedish descendant. They, they, I think they, they maintained uh, closer links. Lucy. No, nope, unmute. We should, should I put it? Hi, we still have a lot of connections with Sweden. But interestingly, my father-in-law, he was a bit of a problem solver um, in his own right. He owned Vanguard, which is on the A um, A40, and he did a lot of structural. Um, mm. For example, he lifted elephants that had got into ditches in um, the zoo in London Zoo and things like that. <laughs> so there's a connection there. He put the buses up for Evil Knievel to put his motorbike to jump the motorbike over. How cool. So he but I, 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 I'm more worried that I'm missing an E in my name. I'm going to yes, correct that's it. that's the aristocratic um, <laughs> Sanderberg. Yeah. Right, my, um, our relative um, uh, founded the East um, Swedish East India Company in the 18th hmm. century. So there. But it's a very interesting talk. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's okay. 
Thank you, Alex. I see some people um, applauding. They can unmute if, if they if they wish. But uh, um, so so thank you again, Neil, and I look forward to seeing you in person uh, before too long. And thank you, everyone, and um, uh, council members as well for for keeping things um, running. So um, we've got um, uh, one um, uh, author. Uh, speaking to us next next month and um, it's on the website so uh, no spoilers from me and uh, beyond that we've got a few things in the pipeline um, thank you to uh, David uh, Goldsmith um, uh, who, who kicked this off and uh, Robert Freeman who then really picked up the baton we've we've managed to keep things going um, every month and um, we'll continue to do so anyway thank, thank you so much Neil and um, and, and everyone else Thank you all. Thank you for listening. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.